uh, you mentioned it here, the Start of America trip. Uh, you were here. Um, you know, we were both involved in it, and there was a breakout session for the afternoon. A big part of it was actually sort of real engagement with uh, people that had come to talk about uh, things. This was happened in eight cities. Um, has there been any out action that came out of that? Has there been any real follow up? So here's the challenge of the way government works for my personal visibility is when you leave, you really leave. So the honest answer is I don't know. We have this in like May, right? So the idea is to have this start in our roadshow, get all these ideas, have them funneled in both in some manner into the president that was going to go in, but also going to feed into this larger innovation policy process. The process which will include this advisory committee meeting in Boulder and we're having to have this conference here. At the end of the year, there'll be a report to Congress on innovation policy. So I think when I was here, I tried to make the point, judge whether they got it by that policy proposals to Congress in the end of the year. There may well be things in the President's speech that he gave, I like Sarah given it tonight, to talk about job creation and entrepreneurship that emerge in this process. Part of the challenge in policy making is different streams of information come in and sometimes different ideas get reinforced in different concepts. So I do know that people were heard, that ideas were developed in. I don't know exactly what the status is and what we'll see emerge on the other end. Talking about impact, uh, when you think about your time in DC, including your time as the top cop in, the top cop in agriculture, which I just love saying. Um, maybe I'll get a phone book here if you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, and maybe we could do, like, you have to buy it, and all the money could go to some of the funds. Okay? okay we'll see. Um, it would have to be like a cop who, like, if you, you know, got too much market power, they'd come and tell you, it doesn't work that way in the line. It makes your car grow faster for that car. What was, when you, when you think about your efforts, what was the thing that you think from today, not 10 years from now, but today was the thing you did that was the most impactful? I mean, I do think the Spectrum Initiative, if it happens, is an unbelievable achievement that I am feel to play a part in. The levels of benefit that could come from that. So I don't know exactly how much we as a country benefited by getting more spectrum out to enable the so-called uh, 2G technology to happen. So initially there was one first generation of technology. There were two licenses for spectrum in the 80s. In the 90s there were new licenses that came out that were then all digital networks. The value in job creation in this country in wireless that took off in the 90s was because you got more spectrum out there. The best spectrum that wireless broadband folks want is in this um, band. It would be like 600 megahertz band right below the 700 megahertz band. The reason that AT&T and Verizon are in good shape to offer their 4G services is because they bought the spectrum in 700 megahertz. So for T-Mobile, Sprint, Metro PCS, whoever, they are salivating to get spectrum in 600 megahertz. And by the way, AT&T and Verizon don't even have enough spectrum with what they bought given the demand. So what can happen in that ecosystem with more spectrum is you know, a key point one. A key point two is on the public safety. Public safety officials today are operating with yesterday's technology. To make the transition to today's technology for public safety is going to take a massive coordinated effort. Part of the challenge of public safety, for example, is that every single jurisdiction has made their own purchasing decisions. So if you imagine Federal Express as a confederated set of distinct entities, each of whom decided on their own IT equipment and communications technology, A, they wouldn't interoperate together, which has been a key problem of safety. And B, you know, they would not have economies of scale, they would not be the cutting edge of technology, and that's what public safety is. And so the benefit of public safety, if we can do this right, is also enormous. And then if you're able to do support some innovation in the wireless. This is another area where the U.S. can be a leader, has been a leader. There will also be great benefit there. So I, I would say, and, and obviously there's some personal interest because that was the whole initiative that got me in there, but I, I would say that was a particularly significant effort. 
I don't know how much I can um, be comfortable yet because, you know, we just got one committee and one House of Congress that was able to get behind it on a bipartisan basis, and it took a lot of people to do that. The folks on uh, Kate Billy Hudson's staff, as well as that Rockefeller staff, were extraordinarily hardworking, easy to work with, as I mentioned. We'll see where that issue goes, but that initiative could be a very big deal. I know that you're pretty tuned into the sort of education workforce, uh, STEM K through 12 stuff, um, of which obviously has sort of broad reaching implications. Um, uh, and the question here specifically is, uh, what's being done to promote the rise of the number of women in STEM? Um, but I broaden it, is, is do you have a sense that, is Lucy here by the way? This wasn't Lucy's question. Okay. Lucy Sanders, those that don't know, is the founder of the National Center for Women on Information Technology, right, it's the chair of their board. They're doing unbelievable work on this very issue of women in particularly STEM, where they've been underrepresented among almost all professions now, law, medicine, increasingly business, women outnumber men. Technical, engineering, computer science, still very much adopted. Thanks for the commercial. Uh, for me, <laughs> for me, thank you. But the serious question is, do you, do you have a sense that uh, both the White House and Congress really understand the issue here and the severity of the issue, going back to the seed corn construct and sort of our next generation? I know a lot of uh, kids that are, uh, you know, that are, you know, nephews, cousins, friends, et cetera, that are graduating from college and if they don't have a technical degree, they're, they're not running into a situation of 10% unemployment. They're running into a 50% unemployment situation. There are just no jobs for, you know, for those kids. Um, whereas the science and technical kids are almost fully employed because there's such an imbalance between supply and demand. Is that well understood? Well, and the second problem is people who don't get to college. So the number I saw was college-educated folks are 4.6% but other parts of the population that are not educated, it's much, much higher. So this, for me, is perhaps the most terrifying issue, which is education in general, and say STEM in particular. Are we doing enough? And I will say the race to the top effort, which also came out of the Recovery Act, made a huge impact in some of the broad trends in education reform. There's a lot that needs to be done on educational technology, for example. A lot of jurisdictions, they have to purchase textbooks with their budget. They can't purchase um, you know, iPads and applications or other means of teaching kids. The other challenge here is can we create role models? Because I think, obviously, if every kid wants to be a rugby basketball player, that's great, but it's not going to happen. President Obama had the first ever science fair in the White House. And he, as I said, he loves kids, he had a blast, and he's like, we need to do this, do more of this. And so there's this whole effort, a public private partnership called uh, Educate to Innovate, about getting companies to commit to supporting STEM. The president called from the State of Union, uh, I think 100,000 new teachers in STEM, because one of the challenges also is steep, you know, there's hard to get teachers who are sitting in the to teach STEM. So I am worried about this. I, I, uh, I think one of the challenges we have right now is building a national consensus around these ideas. And this is something where people really matter in terms of developing awareness and a constituency because, as Dale said, the future doesn't have a lot because kids don't have a lot of right quality education. And one of the challenges in some of these areas, education and healthcare are good examples, we haven't totally cracked the code on how to do things. So one of the challenges is can you create experiments to try things and see what works and then scale that up. How has social media shaped policy? It's a great question. Uh, the, the, the true answer is we don't know, right? Uh, there's a great quote, I think Henry Kissinger asked Massey Town, what do you think of the French Revolution? Its response was, it's too soon to tell. Um, <laughs> so we, we, well the other part of the question was, how can it shape policy? Ah. Uh, well, so the first is, this point about building understanding and a narrative around innovation is certainly something where it matters to get people engaged and informed. I will say, for those who haven't seen the work that Brad has done, the effort around Startup Visa was a social media grassroots 
driven effort that has gotten traction and gotten attention. So you should not underestimate the importance of that and the ability of social media to create support. Part of what was valuable there, getting back to the session of the public discussion, is the narrative is so powerful, creates jobs, no cost of the budget, and we are essentially eating our seed corn. If you develop high quality entrepreneurs here or give them an environment to and make them leave and start a company elsewhere, that just strikes people as crazy. Why would we do that? And you were able to tap into that, get that message out there. So I think as a tool of mobilization and education. Now, let me turn to the dark side. I mentioned about these talking points. So you can also have people use talking points on social media, right? Limited number of characters, you have to be able to put it in a pithy term. Um, that can undermine the discourse because if you think about it, when you get through the newspaper, you got a certain amount of information. When you watch a you know evening broadcast, Walter Cronkite, less.